Okay, we're beginning uh, First Chronicles chapter 12, and let me just say this in, in the beginning, okay? We're going somewhere with this message. It's going to take me a while to get there. And when I tie all this, I'm going to take it this direction, that direction, then this direction, and in the end, it's all going to tie together. It's going to make sense to you, okay? And remember, the vision for Wednesday night, we're going to talk about the deeper things of God. And I believe that tonight will, uh, I believe that true prophetic ministry is more than foretelling. It is a, that of spiritual interpretation. And I believe that what the Spirit of God wants to do tonight is interpret what's happening spiritually to you, uh, in your family, this church, our city, our nation, and even all around the world. I believe that that the Spirit of God is really moving and doing certain things. So I believe if we can interpret what's happening to you and give you understanding. All right, so uh, you can be patient with me for a while, can't you, that we kind of lay a foundation, and uh, this is going to, seriously, this will make sense to you uh, in a while. Okay, First Chronicles chapter 12, and I didn't call the verse because some of you snoop ahead and steal Pastor Bill's thunder, so... Uh, we'll, we'll begin at verse 22, 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 22. Well, that time, day by day, there came to David help, okay, and there were, until there was a great host. Okay, so there was a time when David, when David had very little help. Okay, the, so there came, for, day by day, there came to David to help him until there was a great host like the host of God. And these are the number of the bands that were ready, armed to the war, that came to David at Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul to him, according to the word of the Lord. A transitional period, a transition from the season of Saul to David, and we're going to look at, uh, there's going to be different changes here. We're going to see different seasons in David's life and David's ministry here. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to look at this from different times in and so what happens is that God begins to gather him people that he could, uh, for his kingdom, and men of war. Okay, in the same chapter, we're going to skip down to verse 28. And it, the Spirit of God names some, someone and says, And Zadok, a young man, mighty of valor, and of his father's house, 22 captains. So when you look down, when you look down that chapter, you see that the Spirit of God there, Named several different people, and I'm going to call my, my message tonight is Zadok as remnant. Zadok as remnant. There, you're going to see a part of this as that what we call the Zadok priesthood, but we've been talking a lot about remnant, and the word remnant means that which remains. And so remember uh, when Elijah thought he was the only one last, and God said, No, I got 7,000. And so uh, we're going to look at this is a, this is a time, a season, when many people have lost their hunger for God and zeal for God's house. Many people have fallen away. But God said this, I will always have a remnant. Okay, so the temptation, we're going, the temptation will be to go back to the world or return to dead phony religion and play church games. And so we're, we're looking here, and this is the time when David then is, is gathered together. David has been anointed to be king, and, and so... God is uh, helping him get his kingdom together, and he gathers, begins to gather all these people together, and one that the Spirit of God names is, verse 28, Zadok, a young man, mighty of valor, and his father's house, 22 captains. Now we're going to skip down to verse 32, and these are all little individual prophetic pictures. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times. Okay, so that you hear me say that very often, and I don't think I've read that scripture maybe for years, but the Bible said that children of Issachar had understanding of the times or the seasons they were living in. There's different seasons that uh, individuals will go through, families will go through, churches will go through, uh, cities will go through, nations will go through different seasons. And the whole kingdom of God will go through different seasons. There will be times of cleansing, times of purging. Uh, in my, I know you can't tell now, but uh, you know, I, I used to be a hippie and had real long hair and all the LSD and all the crystal meth and, and all the cocaine and all the LSD and all the drugs that I did. And before that, I was in the alcohol scene. I was in a band, drove a Corvette. So all the, all the different things. 
What God did to the hippie generation when, when that was the lowest people upon the face of the earth, God did something called the Jesus movement. Yeah. And what happened was God began to save all these people. And uh, the church I got saved in, uh, us former hippies, there'd be girls walking in there with halter tops and short, 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 short cut off uh, uh, jeans and uh, sitting by people with them in those days in the 70s with, with $1,000 suits, businessmen, and sitting side by side. There was no black, there was no white, there was no rich, there was poor. Either you were lost or you were saved. And basically in that church, either either you were saved or in the process of getting saved. <laughs> and people were just... As, People were just showing up. Yes. People just all over all over America, yes. millions of, of young people just showing up. God was drawing them, awesome. and they're just showing up at the house of God, yeah. and uh, all these people get saved. Then God followed that by what we call the Charismatic Renew Movement. You go way back before that, and, and I have a part of that within me. That, and before that, uh, there was a season, there was five farmers up in uh, Vancouver, Canada, they begin to fast and pray for a revival, and the Spirit of God came upon them, and there's something they called the Latter Rain Movement uh, came, and that's when they were calling people out of wheelchairs, and that's when personal prophecy was really released upon the church. I've been through uh, seasons of, of teaching. There was like a 15-year season where God was doing all the teaching. So there was the Jesus Movement. There was a, there was the Latter Rain Movement, the Jesus Movement, the Charismatic Renew Movement. Then there was a teaching. There was a di- discipleship. A season where God was discipling, uh, many of these people got saved, and then deliverance began to come into the scene. 1994, and God poured out His Spirit in Toronto, and it began to spread all around the world. The Spirit of Revival, and once again, people uh, renew and revival uh, and ref- times of refreshing was coming from the presence of God. So, if you understand, uh, if you don't like the season you're in, you can change it. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Uh, individuals uh, can change, and and you can have you and I can have personal revival anytime we want it. We just begin to to practice the thing that God tells us to do. But to get to get into my text here, the children of Issachar they had understanding. They had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So they had times of the understanding of the season that they were living in. Now the word understanding means they had knowledge, they had wisdom, they had meaning, they had perception, and I love this word. They had discernment. They understood the season they were in. Uh, you, you understand there be times where God will chastise them. We we've talked about that recently. We've been talking a lot about the office of a prophet. That God will people get off track. God will there be a season of chastisement, and the chastisement to bring people back into alignment with God's word. And a lot of people call that judgment. What it really is is consequences for the choices that we make. And the consequences are to bring us right back back into the fulfillment of the things of the Spirit. Okay, so the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their, at their commandment. Okay, now um, let's go to um, 2 Samuel chapter 15. Again, be patient with me while I lay this foundation. Second Samuel, chapter 15, and verse 23. We're looking at a different season here now. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over. The king himself passed over the book Kedron, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. And lo... Zadok, remember Zadok back there in Chronicles? Okay, Zadok, who was called a mighty man of valor. Now remember, the end of Saul, when, when, a, when Saul fails, God is not called unaware, Saul's on his way down and out, and God's raising up a David. It's always, that's how it always is. And so whenever you see, whenever you see leadership that's failing and have compromised, and on the way down, when Eli was on his way down, God was raising up a Samuel. When Saul was on his way down, God was raising up a David. That's how it goes. God's never caught unaware. So the, one of the points I want to make right there is understand seasons, okay? And understand if you see bad things happening in the body of Christ or you see bad things happening in your nation, in your city, in your church, or in your family, or in you, when there's a season of going down and losing ground, the next season is what? God not called unaware. Okay, so... If you're going down, you can bring yourself back up. Sometimes you got to go down to realize yes. 
Sometimes you've got to go pretty far down to realize you don't have what you thought you had. And then you begin to get what you thought you had before, but you really didn't have it, or else you wouldn't have lost such ground. And that is what we call revelation of herself. Wish the sons of Issachar had understanding of the season. And if we could understand where we really are with God, how little that we really have, or how far we have yet to go, then it, it, would, it would really help. Okay, so now, okay, so they're crossing over here, and, and these, uh, they passed over the book Kedron. And they're going towards the, the wilderness. Now, let me, let me just say this, that uh, this is the same wilderness. This is uh, uh, Saul's pursuing. Saul wants to kill David. And um, so this is the, the do you remember when, um, remember when uh, David got anointed to be king and he killed the giant and then Saul became jealous? And remember all those years that David hid in the, in the wilderness? And, and Saul was pursuing him. Okay. Now, what happens is, now what, what happens is there's another season here, and David now finds himself right back in the same wilderness that he was in before. Have you ever been right with God, and you went a good season with God, living for God? And then you, sometimes, maybe sometimes you get a little apathetic, get a little bored with things, a little bit of compromise. You just get a little lackadaisical. You get a little lazy. And the enemy, the storm clouds are gathering against you, but you don't discern it because you have no understanding at the time that you're living it because you've taken back control back over your life. Now we've taken over the lordship and the dominion. We're in charge now. We go to church every now and then uh, as long as it doesn't go too long because we don't want to hear too much truth because God will deal with us. And so then we, you know... (laughs) So David finds himself, like I get out of that, David, <laughs> David finds himself right back in the same wilderness. You ever been through something you thought, I'll never be back here again? <laughs> I'll never, I'll never do it again. <laughs> I'm out of this. I'll never, I'll never go back into this. And David finds himself right back in the same wilderness where he was before. Now watch this in verse 24. Now we're going to be talking about this man Zadok so that uh, you know, if I'm not communicating clear enough, and this is going to all kind of come, come the, uh, the pieces of the puzzle are going to come together for you here a little bit. So remember this man Zadok, because remember we're looking at Zadok as remnant. Very important that you understand, remnant means that which remains. Now, all, the, all what the world has out there today, and all that false religion has, has seduced most of the people upon earth where they're on their way to hell. Or they lose their inheritance. So they're not, they're not getting their inheritance that the Spirit of God prophesied to us tonight about. There's an inheritance. Yes, uh, let, me, let me just put it this way, and, and I'll say this more later. Before I got saved, I, w- I was a ball player, and I know that many of you heard this, but some have it, and, and it, it makes my point very well. Before I got saved, I was a ball player. I drove a Corvette. I was in a band. Um, I had money. I had I had a lot of things going. I, I had a lot of crystal meth. I had a lot of cocaine. I had a lot of LSD. Had a lot of friends. I had a lot going for me. But when I got when I got saved, because I got this, I've never drank a beer since 1975 or any kind of liquor. No liquor. No no illicit drugs have been in my body since 1975. No uh, no no premarital sex since 1975. Why? Because I got this. I didn't join a church. I got born into the church. Because the Spirit of God came into me, and it says in, in John 1, 12, to as many that received him, gave him the power to become. Because I had been a ball player, because I'd been in a band, I knew how to become a ball player. I knew how practice made. I knew how to put forth the effort and train my body, get my body uh, in physical condition, I knew how to practice certain things, the different sports that I played, so that my body so that I could play better. Because I did want to be a spectator. Amen. As a ball player, I did not like riding the bench. Amen. I wanted to be in the game. Okay, So then I was willing to pay the price to get involved. So when I became a Christian, I didn't want to watch other people enjoy God. I wanted to, be, I wanted to join them. I, want, I wanted all that God had for me. Okay, so that's the way it was in the world. That's what it was when I was a ball player. And so when uh, I, I never, never went, I never went to a party. 
I, I never went to a party. I never, I never went to a, a, con, a concert the band was in. And I, I never brought up this, this little thimble. And I, I never walked into Honky Tonk and said, Now that's what I'm going to drink tonight. Don't give me very much now. Amen. I don't want to come under the influence. No, I, I wanted to come under the influence. And so when I got saved, I wanted to come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I know some people don't understand my natural illustration. A lot of people are not used to a preacher talking this way, but a lot of people do understand what I'm saying. And this gets across better than, than deep theology, and he, this comes across clearer than Hebrew and Greek. A lot of people know Hebrew and they know Greek. They don't have enough anointing to blow a fly off the end of their nose. Amen? All right. Okay, so when the, the key here, and I'm going to say this later, the key... You got to really give what God has for you. When you give what God has, when you get this, you're free from that. To as many that received Him, He will give you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe upon His name. So we got to understand: you don't you don't just put your body in the church building. No, when you give your heart to God, then God comes into your heart. He owns your heart. See, He had bought us with the blood of Jesus Christ. So, gee, then to as many that received. To many that received him, not put their body in the church building. To many that received him, I received him. And God gave me the power to become. So I didn't, so I knew, I knew how to grow as an athlete. So I, I put the same principles in line how to grow as a Christian. Okay, then secondly, it says in Acts 1 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit of God should come upon you. So there's a secondary anointing that you share. There's a there's salvation. There's an anointing come to that. There's a second anointing that comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then John the Baptist said about Jesus, "There's one coming. There's one coming after me that's mightier than I. He shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with the the fire." So there's a third baptism, a baptism of fire. So there's a salvation, the baptism of water, the baptism of the Spirit, and there's a baptism of fire. Now we're coming back to the Zadok guy. My title tonight is Zadok is Remnant. Because, uh, and remember that's why Pastor Dan was recommending the book I Am Remnant over there and explained the remnant. It's very important that we understand that God God said this, I will always have a remnant that will not bother need to bail. They're not compromised. They won't play church. They will, they will not be in bed with the world. They will, they will have spiritual intimacy with God. Okay, so here's this Zadok guy in verse 24. Remember that God said, God said, God described Zadok as uh, a mighty man of valor. So in verse 24, and little Zadok also, and the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God, and Abathar went up until all the people had, were passing out of the city. And the king, and King David said to Zadok, now I, I think earlier I said this wrong, I got mixed up on my times. This is when Absalom, this is not, this is not Saul here. This, this is the season where Absalom then was usurping authority, and Absalom was wanting to take the throne. There was a power struggle over the throne. So Absalom here is what he did. Absalom started going through Jerusalem and saying behind David's back, saying, his own daddy would say, so he would go through, if I were king, I would. If I were king, I would. So he's doing things. He wants to win the hearts of the people to turn them away from David. And so what happens is now, so Absalom gains control. He gets enough people. And uh, I, need, I do need to inject this. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, this whole thing kind of comes is because of one day, the Bible says it this way, when, when men went out to war, David stayed home. When kings went out to war, David stayed home. And he walked down the rooftop and he saw a naked woman by the name of Bathsheba taking a bath. And he could not, the voyeurism devil talked to him, and he couldn't get his eyes off her. David saw her. David sent for her. And David sinned with her. And there were consequences to David's sin. Okay, so this is part of the chastisement when you understand that the, the reason, so then Absalom rises up against him so when Nathan the prophet comes to David and said uh, that the child will die and the sword will be against your house. Okay, the sword is against, the sword here is, uh, this is frustration against David because he had sinned with Bathsheba. Now, so he's going to go through a season of chastisement. And you have to understand 
that God is a just God. So when we make, when we willingly and knowingly and premeditatively we make wrong choices ahead of time, God is fair. He's even fair with the devil. If we choose not to forgive, then we're the devil will stand before God. Said so and so has unforgiveness. You had said if if they don't forgive, they're turned over to the tormentor. You got to give me legal right to them to torment them. Okay, so anybody beside me ever been had unforgiveness towards someone and a little bit of torment brought you right back? I wasn't so willing to forgive at first, but then after a while, it didn't take long. <laughs> Okay, but that, so that you'll have understanding of what's happening here. Well, I'm not trying to get bogged down with that. But the point is, the point is this. It was that David had been anointed to be king. David had sinned. Now, everybody in the New Testament is a priest, a king. Okay, so you understand the New Testament believer that you've been brought into this kingdom. Okay, so I'm bringing that to the place that you and I can make a mistake. There may be some chastisement. The point that you need to understand here. David has not been removed from the throne. Amen. When, when, when Nathan the prophet said, came and said, Thou art the man, David did not say, Take not the throne from me. He said, Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from your presence. What David valued more than the throne was God's presence and the Holy Spirit of God. That's probably why he was able to stay within, uh, stay as king. But there was trouble in his city. And the trouble came to David because he had sinned. But watch God work now, okay? You have to understand God is a God of restoration. Yes. Okay? Somebody make a mistake, you don't get eliminated. And if, sometimes if we, if uh, God tests us and we flunk the test, you don't get eliminated. Amen. We just get to take the test over. Amen? Amen? That's yes. the patience of God. That's the love of God. That's the mercy of God. Yes. Okay, I'm getting real bogged down here, but I, I feel like, <clears throat> I think it'll help you understand. So this is the time when Absalom is usurping, there's mutiny. In, uh, in Israel. Okay, so verse 24, so and lo Zadok also and the Levites were with David. David's leaving the city of Jerusalem. And he'd taken the ark of the covenant of God. They set down the ark of God. And Abathar went up and other people had done passing out of the city. And David said to Zadok, David the king said to Zadok, carry back the ark of God to the city. Now, here's basically what David's saying. David's saying, Okay, the ark of God doesn't belong with me. I want the ark of God to be in Jerusalem. I want the ark of God to be planted here and stay here. And David had faith. If I'm if I'm the, to be returned, if I'm to have peace and come back to the throne, then I want the ark to be here. And so then I'll come back to where it is instead of taking it where I'm supposed to be. And uh, there's a lot of love. There. There's a, a lot of faith right there. Now, Amen. turn to Second Samuel chapter uh, chapter. Uh, 17, 2 Samuel 17 and verse 15. Then said Hushai unto Zadok, there's Zadok again, and to Abathar the priest, thus and thus did uh, whoever counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and thus have I counseled. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Launch not this night in the plains of wilderness, but speedily pass over lest lest the king be swollen up and all the people that are with him. Uh, at this time right here, now David, David's out in the middle, he's out in the wilderness, he's out there in that wilderness, but Zadok is in the city, and he, he's uh, operating as a counselor in the Absalom, so then Absalom has his counselor, what shall we do? And uh, Absalom takes the counsel of Zadok the priest, and then Zadok sends a messenger to David in the night to protect him, said, David, don't stay here. They know what you're at. I want you to go to another place so that your life would be preserved. Now, do you see that Zadok, do you see that Zadok understands David is not perfect, but he's God's anointed king. God has anointed him to be king, and God has not removed him. And they discern someone's usurping authority. And you've got to understand that the devil will try to usurp authority in your life. Jesus is to be king over your life, and the enemy of your soul wants to usurp that authority, and it was what we call an antichrist spirit. Okay, so uh, Zadok there is loyal to David, so he, he sends him, and he protects the life of David. Now turn to First Kings chapter 1. When we get through this part, then we'll get to where we really want to go. But this is going to help you understand First Kings chapter 1.
and verse 5. Now this is another season where this guy by the name of Adonijah, Adonijah wants to usurp the throne. Okay, so you see David going, this is a good, this is a good point to make. David went through a very, well, a couple seasons with Saul. Saul trying to kill him. Saul coming against him. Then Absalom coming against him. Now you see Adonijah coming against him. Okay, so the point I want to make is that you're going to go through seasons, but the enemy of your soul is going to come to steal, to kill, and destroy you, okay? So we need understanding of the times that we're living in that a lot of demonic has been released. Okay, so in, in uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5, Then Adonijah, the son of whoever, exalted him, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him himself chariots of horsemen and fifty men to run before him. And his father had not displeased had not displeased him at any time and saying, Why hast thou done so? And he was a very goodly man, and his mother bore after Ab- his mother bore him after Absalom. And he conferred with Joab, the son of whoever, and uh, Abathar the priest, and they followed Adonijah and helped him. Okay, so here's these people coming into alignment with Adonijah. But in verse eight, but Zadok the priest, and whoever the son of uh, the Nathan the prophet, so you see Zadok the priest Nathan the prophet, and some of these others. Now remember, the Bible said that uh, Zadok was a mighty man of valor. And Nathan was a prophet of God. He was, a, he was the prophet that God had established in, in Jerusalem at that time. Okay, so he was a very powerful, very influential prophet. Okay, so you see these people that had an understanding at the time. And they had the understanding that God had put David, even though God had made David king, and no man should remove him. Only God should remove him. And that's what they had the understanding of. So they lined up with God's anointed rather than them that were usurping authority. Then that, like Lucifer, got kicked out of heaven. Yeah. There's a rebellion for the sin of rebe- for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Oh, yeah. Just be patient. Well, I know this is a little. This part right here is a little dry, but they're going to make sense to you when we're getting there. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, but Zadok, verse 8, but Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jodokim, and, and Nathan the prophet, and whoever the mighty men, which they belonged to David, then yes. they were not with Adonijah. Okay, so that's what we need to understand. Okay, so that the, they line, there's some lining up with Adonijah, and some are lining up with, uh, with David. And so, see, we need to be able to have wisdom of who to line up with and who not to line up with. It's a very important choice that we make, okay? Now, uh, Janice, you could turn that back air conditioner off probably. Okay, now verse 22 in the, in the same, same chapter. Verse 22 in the same chapter. A lo, while she yet talked to the king, Nathan the prophet came in. And they told the king, saying, Nathan, behold, Nathan the prophet, when he was come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king into the ground. And Nathan said, O oh, my lord, the king, uh, Adonijah, shall reign up to me. So basically what he's telling David is that Adon, uh, that uh, Adonijah is usurping the throne. Verse 32, in the same chapter, verse 32 said, And King David, King David said, Call me Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet. So when David begins to respond to what's coming against him, who does he call? Zadok and Nathan. Why does he call them? Because they have been found Faithful, that's it, because they've been found faithful. Now, when a whole bunch of people fall away, you have to understand, the majority of the people were lining up, they were lining up with Absalom, uh, another time they were lining up with Saul, another time they were lining up with Adonijah. It's very important that you and I have wisdom to know who to line up with. We need to know who God has anointed, who God has put in certain offices, because you don't want to follow someone that will lead you down the wrong trail. Okay, so there's, there's the world, and then there's false religion, and then there's true Christianity, and you and I got the responsibility to know the difference. Okay, so when David then, when he begins to respond, and now we're getting where we can uh, share what the very part, and King David said, Call me Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of whoever, and they came before the king, and, and King David said to them, Take with you the servants of, the, of your Lord, and, and cause Solomon, my son, to ride upon my own mule and bring him down to Gihon and let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there to be king over Israel and blow, blow ye with the trumpet and say, God came sing, King 
Solomon. So David then is in the land. And remember, the word had come through Nathan the prophet that Solomon was to be king. So there, there, so there's a power struggle. There's this whole war of who would the, who would the people line up with? And that's just real quick in, in verse 38 in the same chapter. So Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, the son of Jehudah, the, they went down, they called Solomon to run. So they just basically says that they, they anointed Solomon. Now let's go to uh, Ezekiel 43. Now I laid that foundation so that you would, uh, it would help you understand where we're going to the text now. Ezekiel chapter 43. And in verse 1. And he brought me to the gate, this Ezekiel the prophet, and looked toward the east, and behold, the glory of God, behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the voice of many waters. Now we have to understand that God can, God speaks very loud, God speak, can speak very powerful. There's the still small voice, there's a very loud voice, when he said his voice is like many waters, that would be like Niagara Falls. So when people put God in the box, say, your church service got to be quiet, got to be dead, got to be legalistic. There's no excitement. There's no shouting. The Bible says, shout unto God with the voice of trying. So he said that the glory of God of Israel came by the way of the and his voice. So God began to speak to him and said his voice were like many waters or like Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is so loud that when you stand beside someone, you have to get close to their ear and scream pretty much at the top of your voice so that they can hear you. Okay, his voice was like the voice of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Go down to verse 7. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever, and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile. Now, what, here's this t- a time when the house of God is being defiled. Okay? The house of Israel, they're defiling. He said, they, they shall no more defile, which means pollute, contaminate, it means to make unclean. Neither they nor their kings by their whoredom. Now here's what whoredom means, okay? Now remember, where I came from as, a, as an unbeliever, as a heathen, I was a heathen, heathen. When, when I got saved and I started reading the Bible and I would see words like whoredom in there, I was shocked that God would say something like that in the Bible. Okay, the word whoredom means by their idolatry, by their spiritual adultery. Now, when, when we put something or someone before God, it becomes like an idol. So it becomes like spiritual adultery. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. Okay, so uh, they, they shall they shall shall the house of Israel no more defile or contaminate it. Neither shall they nor their kings by their whoredom defile the house of God by their idolatry, by their spiritual adultery, by their infidelity, uh, by their harlotry. It means to go a whoring. It means fornication. Now, here's we're we're going here in a little bit. Okay, now. Here's one thing that we'll get across to you, is that what if, what, if I, what if I came to church on Sunday morning, and I'm married to Pastor Jan, and so I'm in here for two or three hours on Sunday morning, and I tell, I tell Jan and I tell everybody, I love Pastor Jan. Jan's my wife. I love my wife. But all week long, there's 168 hours in the week. So let's say I give four hours in here Sunday morning, so that, that leaves 164. So 164 hours the rest of the week, I'm, I'm making love to the world, money, things, other women. But I come back on Sunday morning and I tell her that I love her. Now, does that make sense? Now, see, if we come to church on Sunday morning, we say we love God, but we fornicate. We make love to the world, to things. Drinking, drugging, fornicating, lying, cheating, stealing. We spend more time in the gambling casino than we do in the house of God. Uh, an extrovert, loud, excited out there, but bored in here, bound up in here. Okay, so would, would it impress God if I came in here on Sunday morning? I'm here for four hours. I love God. I love my wife. That's the best wife. But the 164 hours of the week, I'm in spiritual adultery with someone, with, with all kind of the world cares of this life, deceitfulness, religion, the lust of things. I'm going after all these other things and all these other people, but I come on Sunday morning and I say the right thing for Sunday morning with my mouth, but all week long I live the wrong thing. See, now we're getting to the nitty-gritty. Okay, we're getting, I laid this foundation, this is all going to make, make more sense to you here a little bit. Okay, he said, they will not defile uh, the, the house of Israel, 
any more by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings and their high places, in their sitting of their high, uh, their threshold by my threshold and their post by my post. And the, now listen how he's, listen how the Spirit of God said this. And the wall that they built between me and them. Wow. They built the wall between me and thee. See, they, wow, they, they, do they don't want God to get to them because they don't want God to deal with their idols. Because yeah. God will, how many found out God oh, will deal with yourself? Yeah. Amen. God will deal with yourself. Yes. Okay, so here John 3.19 said that this is the condemnation. This is the condemnation. Light is coming to the world, but being love darkness, and they will not come to the light lest their evil deeds be exposed. So people will tell you, they, they say a lot, well, I don't want to go to church because there are hypocrites in there. And they'll go right to the gambling scene, they'll go to the drug house, they'll go to the honky-tonk that's full of hypocrites and say, I won't come to church. Well, they're hypocrites. There's hypocrites out there. There's every, everywhere you go, there's hypocrites. I'm not denying that there's hypocrites in here, and that, that there aren't hypocrites in the church of Jesus Christ, but I've got enough discernment to discern them. Yes. Amen. Secondly, I, I, I saw a hypocrite in another place. I saw him in the mirror. So I, that gave me enough homework to deal with my stuff for a while. Okay? Okay, so you, when you get to the place, you, you stop dealing, you stop, you stop trying to use it in a magnifying glass to see everybody else's stuff, and you realize, woe is me. See, when you see God enough that you see yourself, that will give you enough homework for maybe a decade or so. And uh, it will calm, calm you down a little bit. Now, he said that, that you, you built this wall between me and them, and, and he have defiled my holy name. You have defiled my holy name by their abomination. That's things and idols that God detests, that he hates, that he finds disgusting, repulsive, and sinister. Okay, so they're doing abomination, the thing that, that God detests. The reason God detests sin, because he hates what it does to them. Let me put it this way, okay, now. I want you to stop and think about that. I want you to th- stop and think about a godly mommy and daddy. A godly mom and dad, mommy or daddy that love their child. Now, what if that child got a brain tumor? Would they be happy? No, they wouldn't be happy. Because they hate what the cancer does to the child that they love. Yeah. They would be willing to exchange their life for the... Yeah. Come on, you see see the love? Yeah. So the reason God detests sin because he hates what it does to the people. Because it can, it can take them to hell. It can bring them all kind of bondage. It can bring all kind of defilement. It can bring them all kind of trouble. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Sin brings people trouble. Sooner or later, it will cause trouble. And that's why God gave us the word. Now, now listen to what God said. Now, let them put away their whoredom. Again, whoredom, whoredom means their idolatry. An idol is anything or anything we put before God. Do you know, here's how simple revival can be. Revival can just simply be then. Because there are six words as a man. Uh, ministers hear these six words all the time. I can't come to church because. <laughs> I can't come to church because. Now what happens is, revival said that the people get sparked. Instead of saying no to the house, to God at his house, they start saying to the things that they're saying. They say no to the things that they're now saying yes to. I can't, I can't go to the fish fry because they're having church. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to watch uh, the dog have puppies because I'm going to the house of God. <laughs> See, we, when revival says when we start saying no to the thing we've been saying yes to, we stop saying no to God, we start saying yes to God and no to this thing and that, that takes us out from what God has for us, okay? Now, again, now, the key, the key, that statement that I just made, you got to understand you don't just put your body in the church. You, you, God comes into you. And at that time, you're born again, and then God then becomes your father, and then you, God will invade your present to give you a future. And you can't let your past keep you from your future. We've already given the devil now. So God has this inheritance for you. In other words, when, when you get saved, the Spirit of God comes in you. God becomes your father. All things pass away. All things become new. Now you've got a new life, and you've got a journey. You've got a vision. You're going somewhere. You're not bored. You don't just come put your buddy in the church service. To have many that received him gave him the power to become. So when I got saved, what kept me from the party, from the drug, and I knew how to party. Come on, saints of God. I, 
So don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. A whole lot more of you know what I'm talking about than acting like I knew how to party. Come on, I knew. Come on, I saw the sun come up many times. Party all night long. Okay, so uh, you know what? I, I wouldn't. If, it would not have attracted me coming here, sit down, be bored till the day you died. That would not have excited me. But give me vision that God's going to live in me and that God has this inheritance. I'm now a child of God. Old thing passed away. So to basically become a Christian, it, you tell say, say someone, what would you do if you could leave your life all over? See, from this point, you've got a whole new life. Old thing passed away. All things become new. All right. Okay, so now he said, now let them, verse 9, now let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their king far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. So just, um, let me, one of the ways that we can, we can bring that where we're living today. Stop voting in these people that promote homosexuality and abortion. Stop voting these people in. See, because there's accountability to the people that voted them in. Stop electing these people that's bringing destruction to your nation. When Ahab and Jezebel came, when they were king and queen of Israel and made it illegal to mention the name Jehovah, then God raised up a prophet, one prophet, God that brought down their kingdom by one prophet. One prophet and God was the majority over, over the 850 false prophets. Well, I don't have time to develop that, but, okay, so he says, that's what it means, the carcasses of the king far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Now, let's put it this way. How many, how many of us want God to dwell right in the midst of it? In us and all around us, okay? That, that's what it comes down to. It's not putting our church, our body in a dead, boring, dry church service that you can't wait to get out. Even the preachers won't can't wait to get out of some church service that are so dead. Come on, saints of God. That's the way. That's true. Now, verse 10, he said, Thou son of man, show. Thou son of man, Ezekiel the prophet, show the house to the house. See, is that give them a revelation of who they really are, where they're really at, because they cannot see. Because but sin brings the blinding. So show the house to the house. Show show real Christianity. Come on, show real Christianity to people playing church games. Show the house to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquity and let them let them measure the pattern. Jesus is the pattern. So then you read the Bible to see how to look how Jesus lived. That's how we can live. So really, in reality, what happens then, then Jesus comes in. Uh, Jesus himself lives in it and develops the character, the nature of Jesus. You begin to think like Jesus. You begin to speak like Jesus. You begin to behave like Jesus. And your whole life changes, and you're so much more happier and fulfilled. You don't need to drink, drug, and fornicate like an alley cat. Amen. Come on, saints of God. See, when I, when I speak plain, some folk understand that. I don't hear a lot of amens. I get in that Greek and that Hebrew stuff. But when I talk plain, I get some amen. <laughs> Verse 11. And if, if they are ashamed of all that they have done, conditional problem, if they are ashamed of all they've done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof and the goings out thereof. Now, what? see, there's a, Jesus, here, here's what an answer this was to me as, as a hippie. Is that when I felt, Jesus said this, I am the way and I am the true. All my life, I wanted to know how to live. And when I found Jesus, I found truth. And the truth will make you, the truth will make you free. So when I found Jesus, I found truth. And when my life started lining up with truth, everything began to fall in line. Mentally, physically, so I've got this little fire up here. So mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, sexually, emotionally, maritally, ministerially, morally, socially, job skills, parenting skills, education, family, relationships, uh, my heart, and my will was, was dealt with by God. So what happens is that God would give this word, and in this word there'd be an assignment, and I begin to come into alignment with the truth of God. People's life when there's disorder because people are not in alignment with God's word. So God gives a truth to guarantee you to win. Amen. See, when we think that our thoughts are higher than God's thoughts and our ways are higher than God's ways, that's self-idolatry. That's the idolatry we talk about. So that for a man to know what to do, to do it not to him, it is. Okay, so then we come to church and we hear what the Spirit is saying so we know how to win. Yes. Amen? Amen? 
Well, it's not at law legal. So we come to ch- we we read our Bible so that, that we know the pattern. Show the house the house. Show them the pattern. Who's the pattern? Jesus. Okay. All right. Okay. So the show them the going the goings thereof and the, and the comings in thereof and the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof, all the forms. And so that goes on right there. Now, now we're going to get to what uh, where we really want to be. Uh, Ezekiel chapter forty four. Now remember this Zadok man. From here, from here on out, it's going to really start making sense to you. Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 4. Then God brought me by the way of the north gate before the house. And I looked, and behold the glory of the house of the Lord now fell upon my face. And God said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold with thy eyes, and hear with your ears all that I say to you concerning all the ordinance of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof, and mark well the entering in of the house, and every going forth of the sanctuary. And thou shalt say to the rebellious, say to who? The rebellious, rebellious, not everybody, the rebellious, which means those that are bitter, and the rebels, the disobedient, it means those that are contentious. Okay, say to them, say to them that are rebellious even to the house of Israel. Thus said the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it be enough of all your abominations, all all the sin that you, in that you have brought into my sanctuary strangers, which be someone foreign to the kingdom of God. In other words, they're not, they're uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh to be my sanctuary, to pollute it even in my house, where you offer my bread and my fat and my blood, that they've broken my covenant because of all the abomination. Now, what this is basically, what that's saying right there, people coming in that are uncircumcised in heart and in mind and in flesh, in other words, they're not a Christian. and But they're acting like they're Christian. They're saying that they're Christian. They're, they're trying to pretend they're a Christian, but they're not really a Christian because they're called a foreigner here, which means of another kingdom. They're not... You had to be born into the kingdom of God. Okay, so it says, uh, verse 8, You have not kept charge of my holy thing, but you have set keepers of my charge uh, in my sanctuary for yourself. Verse 9, Thus saith the Lord God, No stranger uncircumcised in heart, that means inwardly, nor uncircumcised in flesh outwardly. So they're not been, you haven't given God your heart, you haven't, you haven't brought your inward man under control, and you haven't brought your outward man under control. None of these shall enter into my sanctuary, which means my holy place, my consecrated place. Here's what that's saying, is that there are going to be people that will come to the house of God who have not been circumcised inwardly, they've not been changed inwardly, they've not been changed outwardly. And what they will not experience is the power and the presence of God, because they've not been born again yet. God brings them to a place of salvation, and they, they do not give, they, do not, they don't give themselves to God. Okay, so, uh, so that's why he's saying that uh, they will not enter into his presence. Verse 10, and the Levites that are gone, gone away far from me when Israel went astray. Now, these people go astray. Now, the Levites, who were people that were supposed to assist the priests in ministry. Yeah. Well, maybe we, we might call them today elders, we might call them deacons. Okay, so the Levites and their ministry was to assist the priest. And remember, in the New Testament, every believer is a priest. Okay, so it's very important that we understand this point right here. That the Levites are gone far, not just away from God, but far away from me. God, That's how God says it. When Israel went astray. So Israel went astray, and who went astray with them? The Levites. The Levites went astray with them. Not only did they go astray, they went far away. Now let me... Now let me just kind of inject this in here so that, so because that, this is going to make sense to you in a little bit. It's not making that much sense yet, but it will here in a little bit. Remember when we talked about Saul, the, the majority of people were Saul, but Saul was on his way down. God was raising up David. And then, then remember Absalom. Absalom was usurping. Absalom was going to be on his way down. Absalom was soon going to die, and David was going to be returned to the throne. But the majority of the people were beginning to follow Absalom. So they see, when Israel turned away, the majority of the people, even the Levites, the priests, see, when, when people in the pulpit and the elders and the deacons, when they walk away from God because of what the majority of the people do, 
Now, you and I are right here tonight, okay? Now, are you going to go to hell because the majority of people in America is going to go to hell? No way. Are you going, are you going, you want to go to hell? No. There is a hell. Okay? There is. There's a hell. And you don't want to go there, okay? No Secondly, I don't want to give up my inheritance no way. because the majority of the people are giving up their inheritance. Yes. If I'm going to do this, yes. I'm going to do this right. Amen. I'm going to find out what God's saying. I'm going to come in with alignment with the truth of God. Now, basically, what, what we're going to see here is that is the remnant. The remnant, even the Levites, went far away when Israel fell away. Even the Levites fell away because other people fell away. Are you going to fall away because other people around you fall away? No. Okay, now, what I'm saying is that, see, to, to what really helps us be keepers is that we're going somewhere. That you understand God has given you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe upon his name. So if you get this, you'll be free from that. But if you don't get this, you'll be looking over your shoulder. So what I'm saying is there's a remnant that's got to be found faithful. Okay, and we're going to see that that, that picture is going to begin to come in uh, into alignment now. Now the Levites that had gone uh, far away from me when Israel went astray. Now here's what the word astray means: it means to wander away, it means to be seduced, it means to err, it means to be deceived, it means to stagger. Now remember, I've said this over and over again, but in the Bible the word seduction, first of all, does not mean sexual, it means to be seduced away from the truth of God. To a half truth or to a lie. Satan is a liar, the father thereof. So the Bible talks about doctrines of demons, doctrines of men, and the traditions of men that make null and void the word of God. How many people have come to the church and say, Well, I don't believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the day. I don't I don't believe that a Christian can have a demon. And they want to sword fight with doctrine and uh, and they don't get what God has for them because they, they believe they do not enter in because of unbelief, and they believe doctrines of demons, doctrines of men, and traditions of men that make null and void the Word of God rather than the Word of God. So what you don't want to do is follow false doctrine, especially uh, doctrine that the devil has come up with. Yes. Okay, so Israel went away and went astray from, from me after their idols, which means image. Okay, so someone could say, one of the, uh, I don't have time to develop this tonight. But basically, anytime someone go after their own fleshly appetites, remember the, the, when it talked about they were foreigners, in, in other words, they weren't born again, they, they had not been changed inwardly, and they had not been changed outwardly. But they still practice a form of godliness that denied the power thereof. You're going to see people come to churches, and they've not been changed inwardly, and they've not been changed outwardly, but they think they're going to heaven. Now, and the Spirit of God is going to address that. See, because they're after their idols, and they shall even bear their iniquity, which means the perversity and moral evil and their mischief. Verse 11. Now, listen, listen how the Spirit of God explained this, and, you, and you're going to see this. You will see this in people's lives. What I'm going to read right now, you will know people that have done this. Verse 11. Yet, yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, Having charged at the gates of the house, ministering to the house, they shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them. Yeah. Now, what's that saying? Wow. They're going to be people, see, that have no, they do, they've not been born again. They have no relationship with God. They don't know God. Yeah. They that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploit. Now, because they've not been changed inwardly, and they've not been changed outwardly, but yet they come to the house of God and they pretend to be a Christian, but they won't let God change them inwardly or let God change them outwardly. There's no change within their life. And the Bible said, by their fruits you shall. What that scripture right there is telling you, they will come and they'll do little works. And because they're doing little works, they're trusting in what they're doing, that they will go to heaven on their works and not the work of Jesus Christ. That's what that's saying. They'll come in, and they'll do certain things around the house. Uh, they'll put a $5 bill in the offering. Say, well, I, I gave $5. I came to church on Sunday. Uh, I gave God two hours out of Sunday morning, but I gave the world, and I gave the devil 166. I, I fed my flesh, and I served my idol 166 hours of the week, but I came for two hours, and God ought to be real grateful that I took time out of my week to come to church on Sunday morning. He ought to really, and I put $5 in the offering. 
and you know, I I uh, I, I picked up I picked up a couple. Of, I, I did a couple of trash cans. That will get me to heaven. That's basically what that's saying. They're trusting in their works to get to heaven. What they've done, brother, that Jesus did. Okay, and I'm telling you, that's an abomination in the sight of God. Verse twelve, because they ministered unto them before their idols, and caused the house of Israel to fall in iniquity. Okay, so then see what what bothers God is that when in his house things are done to cause people to fall away. Okay, so because they do this then, therefore I have lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. And they shall not, this is very important that you understand this, okay? And see, this is a warning to me. Because have you ever you ever gone through a season you want to feel God's presence, but try the dry devil will talk to you. Okay, now, now look, verse 13. They shall not come near to me. In other words, the presence of God, the anointing of God, to them will not be real. Have you ever, you ever been in church? Uh, you know, I've been, in, I've been in church. I look, they're on the, I look on the left side. They're talking. They're building. They're anointed. I look on the right side. They're flopping on the floor like fishing. Man, they're prophesying before me. They're giving messages in tongue. They're so anointed behind me, and there I am, like a telephone pole, as dry and stationary. I don't feel. I, <laughs> I feel like a telephone pole. Come on, you ever been there? You look, you look everywhere around. Everybody, everybody else is enjoying the presence of God. See, that's a wake up call for me. So what God is saying, listen, I don't want them to think, and what they're doing, they haven't allowed me to change them inwardly, and they won't allow me to change them outwardly. There's been no change by their preachers. You know them, and so their consequence is what they do not feel the presence of God. See, because their appetites is for the flesh. Now, for the world, they get turned on out there and it's bored in here. Oh, yeah, that's, oh, really. Come on, thank you, God. And see, there, that, has to be, that has to reverse. And see, by faith you accept God, and to a spirit that received Him gave it the power to become. So there's a total commitment that, uh, you, that you give your life to Jesus. You don't just come to church every now and then. That you receive Christ, you confess your sin, you repent of all your sin, and then God reveals himself uh, to you in a powerful way. Okay, so he said, um, verse 13, they shall not come near to me to do the office of a priest unto me. Um, all right, let's keep your finger right there. Keep your finger right there. I'll go to Isaiah chapter 57. I need to develop just remember that thought right there. They shall not come near to me. Isaiah chapter chapter 57 and verse 17. For the iniquity of his covetousness I was wrought, and I smote him. Now, here's how God dealt with him. I hid him. I hid me. He says, I, I hid me. So then, the consequence of the iniquity of their covetousness, which means dishonest prophet, their greed, I smote him. How did he smite him? How, how did God deal with him? I hid. God hid himself. And, and the person went on forwardly in the way of his heart. Okay, so basically then, the manifested presence of God, because then what, what God was doing, he was withholding. They had no inheritance because they were not sons. They were not sons and they were not done. So therefore, he, they don't get the inheritance unless they come under subjection to, to God. Now, they say the same thing another way in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is that short that it cannot save. Neither is God ear hear, God's ear heavy that it cannot hear. So if God could hear Jonah and the belly of a whale at the bottom of the ocean, can God, can God hear you tonight? Can God hear you tomorrow? Okay. So his hand is that short that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, heavy that it cannot hear. But our iniquity has separated us from God. And our sins uh, has caused him to hide to. He has hid his face from you that he will not hear. Uh, while we're there, let's pick up Hosea and that will say it in another way that will help you understand. In the book of Hosea, chapter 5 and verse 6, Hosea is at the beginning of the Minor Prophets. Hosea chapter 5 and verse 6, They shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord. But they will not find him, because he has withdrawn himself from them. Why would God withdraw himself from some people? Because of sin. 
Okay, in other words, if you don't understand what they're saying, is that, see, here's what God does not do. we got to understand this. God does not reward inappropriate, sinful, idolatrous behavior. See, you can't go, you can't sin and win. The consequence of the sin is to bring us back into alignment with truth. Here's God's blessing. Okay, so when we sin, and the idolatry, the sin separates us from God. If you've ever had the presence of God, and then lose the presence of God, if you've ever had the favor of God, and then do something the way you lose the favor of God, then here's how God will get your attention. You won't feel His presence. Because I'm telling you, because I've been there. I know what it's like to be drunk. I know what it's like to be in the influence of alcohol and very powerful drugs. And I'm telling you, when I got saved, this was better than that. When this becomes better than that, you're free. But if you don't get this, there's still your... See, that's what the problem was. The man was not changed inwardly. He was not changed outwardly. So the... The idols of his heart and the lust of the flesh were still controlling him, even though he put his body in the church service. And people will do that and think, of, I do a little bit of work. I'll come to church. I take time out of my busy schedule. I'll come to church for an hour and a half on Sunday morning. God ought to bless me. And God, ought, God should reward me because of my behavior. So God should, uh, I should, I'll go to heaven on my terms and not on God's term. Okay, so we have to understand then, God will get people's attention uh, and then let me come back to David. When David sinned with Bathsheba, and Nathan the prophet exposed the sin, and David confessed, then David gets along with God and he wrestles. And he tells God, create in me a deal with the inward man. And he tells God, cast me not away from your... So how did God get his attention? He withdrew his... First of all, the prophet had to... The prophet had to... Get... He wasn't responding to the dealings of God, so God had to send to him a prophet. And that got his attention. And even when the prophet first spoke, he wasn't real honest at the beginning. So then David's prayer was, cast me not away from your... Take not your holy... If you've ever been anointed. I don't care who you are, where you are. I don't care what city, what nation. If you've ever been anointed and lose the anointing, you're miserable. There's nothing, there's no one. I don't care. I don't care how powerful your drug is. I don't care how beautiful that person is in the flesh. They cannot fulfill, out fulfill God. I don't care what nation you're in, what language you speak. I'm telling you, the presence of God, if you've ever been anointed and lose the anointing, you're miserable. If you've ever had the manifested presence of God and lose the manifested presence of God, you feel dry and barren like a desert. Get me out of this desert. I'm telling you, you got until you can see the desert and God's love and mercy. The desert, the dryness is to get you back in the presence. That's to get our attention. Uh, I'm, a little bit of desert time is better than an eternity in hell. Sound doctrine? That's a whole lot. That's a whole lot better. So desert time is designed to get our attention to get us back into alignment with the truth of God. So that's what David said. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from your. So uh, I want you to just. I want you to just stop and think. Being. King David. Anointed David. You know. Dancing David. Giant killing David. And he. He got him. I don't know how many wives he had at that time. I mean he's got. He got a honey on the side. He got Bathsheba. And here he is king, and then a prophet comes in, gives him a prophetic parable. And then he doesn't figure out who God's talking about. And so Nathan has to say, thou art the man. Have you ever had something, somebody say something, the blood just drained right up. Can you put yourself in David's shoes at that time? And the blood just kind of drained, thou art the time, exposed. Why did God expose him to save him? The exposure was his mercy. The exposure was, David, you're gonna, you have boo boo. There's gonna be a season of chastisement, but you will get restored because God is the God of love, He's the God of mercy, and He's the God of restoration. Okay. (laughs) 
Hosea. Okay, uh, in Hosea chapter 5, uh, they should go with their flocks and their herds to seek him, but they would not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. Uh, verse 15, the same chapter, I will go and I will return to my place until they have acknowledged their offense. I will go and I will hide. When I was a kid, we played hide and seek a lot. I lived out in the country, a little town, 800 people. We played hide and seek a lot. I used to get scared when I couldn't find them. <laughs> and, and God was hiding himself from these people. How long? And why? Until they acknowledge their sin. I'm telling you, God, God, God has methods of saving people. It's God's love, it's God's mercy, it's God's patience that God is arranging circumstances to bring a sinner home. May think you need this money, may think you need this lover, may they think you need this alcohol, may think you need the drug, may think you need this partying, and what we really need is God. And what we really need is God. So God says, I will go and I will return to my place until they acknowledge their sin and seek my face and in their affliction. Have you ever, anybody beside me, ever caused yourself some affliction? Oh, yes. Yeah. Which means trouble? Oh, yes. You ever caused yourself some trouble? Oh, yeah. In your trouble, yeah. they will seek me early. Oh, All right. Now, let's go make more sense. Go to uh, back to Ezekiel 44. And I think we, we read verse 13. They shall not come near me to do the office of a priest nor come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place, they shall... Well, uh, let me... Uh, all right, let me, here's how I'm going to put this. And you hear me say this fairly often, but this is a good way to this make sense. How many of you are going to work a job 40 or 50 hours a week and never get any paycheck? You, you know, if you exchange this time and this energy, then they ought to, are you, are you going to go to work 40 hours a week for the rest of your life and never get a paycheck? No. No. See, there's people that come to church for decades and never get what God has for them. Amen. And until we acknowledge that, see, what I'm telling you is that God is raising up shepherds, not harlings. God's raising up shepherds that will tell people the truth that won't allow people to sit there for their whole life not being saved and never telling them the truth, not telling them that they're not saved or how to get saved, that God, God's ways are higher, God's ways are better, but using them to meet a need within ourselves as leadership. I'm saying that there's a remnant, there's a, a uh, well, we're going to look at Zadok as, as a, there's a remnant, that's going to enter into the fullness of the thing. So let me put it this way. As, as we're not going to go to work and work 40 hours a week and never get a paycheck, you know, here they come with it. Uh, here's $1,500 for this week. Oh, no, no. I don't want anything. You kidding me? Give me that check. So I'm not going to come to church without getting what God has for me. I may want more God. I may want more love, more joy, more peace, more authority. More wisdom. Oh, yes. Amen? Okay, so there's all these things that we're pursuing, and we get all that when we seek God. We don't seek the thing, we seek God. All right. Now, uh, verse 13, and They'll not come near to any of my holy things, and the most holy place they shall bear their shame and their, abom and their abomination which they had committed. In other words, they're gonna, they sow to the flesh. So it says in Galatians, If you sow to the flesh, you shall the flesh reap what? Corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we shall the Spirit. Spirit reap life and life everlasting. Okay, so that's what God's saying right there. People that sow to the flesh, what's their reward? Corruption. Yeah. But they think that they're winning because they're under the teaching of the world. And the world, Satan is the God, little g, of this world, and Satan is the father of all lies. So Satan lies. And then people believe a lie and think they're winning, but in reality they're losing. Okay, so verse 14. But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the service thereof, for all that's been done. They may greet, greet people at the door. They'll do different things, you know, and they're because they're trusting in the works, but they don't experience the power of God. Now everything changes right here, verse fifteen. But, yes, Lord. but the priest, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, Zadok mean his name means righteousness, 
But the priest, the Levites, the son of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the Levites, well, I'm sorry, when the children of Israel went astray. Now, they, the, most went astray, but there were some that stayed faithful. Okay, now they stayed faithful to God, and they stayed, what happened, what they do? They got in position, and they stayed in position. Have you ever seen someone come to the house of God and they're, they're in church for a while and then they disappear? They go back out. See, there's a two-fold battle. Number one, get the victory. Number two, keep the victory. Because someone comes to the altar, prays the sinner prayer, and say, I want to follow Jesus. doesn't mean they're going to serve Jesus all the day of their life. Because Satan will come to steal the seed that's been planted within them. They need more prayer after they pray the sinner's prayer than what they did before to get them to come to church and pray the sinner's prayer. Okay, so what... This is very important. This is a prophetic picture here. Now, there's a prophetic picture before of people that would come to the house of God and trust in what they're doing. There's been no change in their life. There's been no inward change. There's been no change in their flesh. They're still led by their flesh and worldly appetite, but they come to the house of God every now and then. But when they go out there, they're in sin. Okay, so that so then they never get the rewards of righteousness. They never get. They never get. Prophetically, God said today that you are his inheritance, but he is our inheritance. That's the inheritance. God is our inheritance. And when we would rather have things of the world than God to be our inheritance, we're not winning. Okay, so there's a whole other uh, anointing that God has for us. Okay, but the priest of the, the priest of the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me. Now, let me explain that just a little bit because that is very, very important. That uh, when we learn how to really carry on two-way conversation with God in prayer, when we learn that God will inhabit the praises of his people, why do we sing? Why do we praise? Why do we worship? Number one, it's in the Bible. God tells it to. Secondly, God loves it. God manifests himself right in the praises of his people. So then, so, so then basically what he's saying is, okay, though, though the multitude, though the nation fell away, though Jerusalem fell away, though many of the Levites fell away, the sons of Zadok, they were faithful and they kept my sanctuary even though there was only a few of them. Now, the two things, two books that I recommend to you, number one, The Path by Rick Joyner over there, and number two, the I Am Remnant by Pat Shatzline. And he explains this. And here's, here's what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7. Broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many there are thereon. Many people, most people, are on the path to destruction, but they think they're winning. But narrow is the path that leads to life. Narrow is the path that leads to life. So in the book, The Path by Rick Joyner, there is this cruise liner out in the ocean, and that speaks of religion, and the little boat comes in, to go in this dangerous, narrow path that leads to the mountain and go up the mountain because there's fire upon the mountain. So they leave that which is comfortable to walk this dangerous path, to walk, to go on the journey, to come into the fullness of God because God has called his people to the mountain and there's fire upon this mountain. And God said, do you, I, I am the Lord, I am a consuming fire. Okay? Better to have the fire of God, the anointing of God, than fire of hell. Amen? Sound doctrine? That's real sound doctrine, okay? Okay, so there's little things here that I need to kind of elaborate upon it that, that uh, if I don't explain it to you, uh, the enemy might be able to steal this from you, okay? But the priest of the Levites, the son of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray, remember that was to be seduced from truth, to live a lie. That would be, that would be, compromise real biblical Christianity to play church games, yeah. which there's no, you know, you, you lose either way. Either the world or playing church game, living a lie in church building, you lose either way. So the rebuke was for people that came and their life had not changed. There had been no inward change within their heart. There had been no change in their flesh. So what they didn't have, they didn't have the anointing of God. Okay. So when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me. They, the sons of Zadok, that remain in the sanctuary, that remain faithful to God, 
though the multitude fell away, though the nation fell away, though the city fell away, though many people that they knew fell away, they remained faithful. They kept the charge. They kept charge of my sanctuary. Look around. You see people keep in charge of a sanctuary. Yes. Amen. I've, always, I've always loved Wednesday, Wednesday night and Friday night because uh, I, I believe hungry people come. Uh, I just believe that. Uh, hungry people come in the middle of the week. Okay, so he said, they shall come near to me to minister to me. How many want to be near to God? Yes, so he said, draw nigh to me. If we draw nigh to God, God will draw nigh to, to us. Okay, so what he's saying right there is that you will, number one, you will know God. They that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. Okay, and uh, you have the manifest presence of their God. Okay, so they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, said the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary. They come near to my table or my presence to minister unto me, to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. So basically what that's saying, they'll come. See, because the remember before the wall was there? Now the wall says, see, with people right with God and right relationship, the partition, the veil has been rent. You now have, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you now have access to God. So now we come to God, and we can talk to God. We have a relationship with God. The wall has come down. He's Father, and we are sons, and we are daughters, and we are children of God. So we can know God. Okay, so uh, it's important that we understand this, this right here. And it's in John 14, 21. He that has my commandments and keep my commandments, that's the one that loves me, and I, Jesus, will manifest myself to him. That's what we call the manifested presence of God. Now what I'm saying is that it's my response. Well, God wants you, every believer, to experience the presence of God. It's my responsibility to teach people what the presence of God is, how to get in the presence of God, and what will keep us from the presence of God. It's your responsibility to live in such a way you can get in the presence of God because in His presence is... In His presence is... Have you found out that did not say in church... It didn't say in church, because you can be in a church building and be miserable. Yes. See, because there's no access to God. So uh, what keeps, I've already shared it, but what keeps people from the present? Your sin has separated you from me. And see, one of the most damning sins is unbelief. It's one of the... See, people would think homosexuality, lesbianism, perversion, this and all that, that's really wicked sin. In many ways, the most damning sin of all is unbelief. Amen. They entered not in because of... Okay, so they surrendered the presence of God, and the Bible says, in His presence is fullness of joy. Yes. Have you ever seen someone in church and miserable? Yes. Because they were not in His so, see, God wants you to be in His presence. He wants you to understand the power of His presence, how to get in His presence, how to enjoy His presence, how to soak up, absorb, receive His presence. Here, and you can, you can be so anointed in the shower, driving the car, in your living room. You can be in your backyard and be in the presence of God. It can be so powerful. that That's relationship. That's fellowship. That's partnership, companionship, communion with God. So you have the manifest presence of God. So there's something beyond just putting our body in a church building. It's getting in the presence of God. That's, that's why we pray. That's why we sing. That's why we pray. That's why we worship. The woman that was hammered, if I could just reach, if I could just reach out in. If I could just reach out in. See, we can touch God with our love. We can touch God with our singing. We can touch God with our prayer. We can touch God by word. We can touch God by faith. Needs. Needs is not what motivates God. Faith. Faith moves God. Faith moves God. Okay. Verse 16 again. And we're going somewhere. They shall enter into my sanctuary. They shall come near my table. That's the showbread. To minister unto me. And they shall keep my charge. Now in the same chapter look at verse 23. Now this is you. This is... If you want to know the remnant, look around this room. You see part of the remnant. Verse 23. 
and they the remnant, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. Okay, so we in leadership that got a call of God upon our life, we need to teach people the difference between the holy and the profane. The profane means this. It means that which is unholy, that which is devoted to ordinary use in contrast to a sanctified holy use. It means thirty. Thirdly, something that is polluted. Fourthly, something defiled by coming in contact with the dead. Now, how many people do you know will come to a church service and get a major victory and go out among the dead? They leave the land of the living and they're, they're hanging around with people that are spiritually dead. And death gets imparted into them. And when they come back to the house of God, they've been polluted, contaminated, defiled. Vexed, their spirit has become vexed. Okay? That's what that means, okay? Now, uh, I. Vernon Tompkins defines profane as dealing very lightly with what God calls holy. In other words, they come to the house of God and didn't respect it. And remember now, their life had not been changed. They had not been, their heart had not been changed. Their inward man had not been changed. Their outward man had been changed. But they came to church every now and then, and they did a few little things around now. Okay, so the responsibility, now God has the remnant right now, right now, is one of the darkest times in our nation spiritually. This is one of the darkest times in the history of our nation. This is one of the darkest times upon the face of the earth. That the, uh, everything that's happened with terrorism and Islam growing faster than Christianity. Christians now are being martyred again. And uh, whether, uh, let me explain it this way. You as an individual, there, there are individuals right now in our, in our nation that are experiencing revival. They're alive with God. They're doing real well with God. There are families in America doing well with God. There are churches that God is really moving in their individual church. There are certain movements upon the face of the earth where God's really moving in that movement. What I'm saying, overall, in our nation and on planet earth, that things are getting darker than lighter. That's not Nick. That's the truth. Okay? Now, so we have lost ground spiritually in our nation. When, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, go, this will date me, but back in the day that I got saved, they had something they called the blue law. And businesses weren't even open on Sunday because of the respect. See, now, think of the people now that are hindered to coming to the house of God because now the God of this world is establishing and taking more, taking more, taking more, taking more ground, taking more ground. And now you see homosexuality uh, being promoted. Look at look at uh, Bruce Jenner, uh, uh, now, calling him, now calling himself Caitlin. See, going through the media, going through television, Movie, they're going to make a star out of him. And now, don't miss this now, because I saw an interview with him, and and Bruce Jenner pointed his finger right in the camera, and he said, "I'm going to change the world." And I'm telling you, spirit-filled Christians are not changing themselves, let alone the world. See, what I'm telling you is that we got to we've got to teach the difference between the holy and the profane. When the profane does not bother the church, I'm saying it bothers God. And see, what I'm telling you is that all this thing that led up to this, that God did not want the people to, that was coming defiling themselves. No, you're not that you're the, they're defiling themselves, and they're bringing defilement to the house of God and defiling His temple. And I'm telling you, they were what happened to them is that they thought that was church, and it, God said, that's not church. I don't want you to think that that's Christianity. That's not Christianity. So that he withheld himself and he hid himself from them until they confessed, until they repented, because God loved them too much to let them go to hell thinking that they had everything. He didn't want them to stand before God lost thinking they were saved. So he had to do something to get their attention. What is God doing in your life to get your attention? Ah, God, my God. I know what that is shouting right there. I got quiet right there. Come on, saints of God. Now, what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you, that God is raising up shepherds that are going to tell people the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Now, here's what a lot of people do that know they're in sin, they have no intent upon changing, 
This is the condemnation. Light is coming to the world. And men love. They love darkness. They love that They will not come to the light. No, you're not the evil of the light of the world. They will not come to the light unless their evil deeds be exposed. You are the last place some people want to hang around because you bother them. The light of Jesus in you convicts them. And they feel convicted. They have no intention upon getting saved. God give you the time to get to that because don't let me forget to get to John. Don't let me close without going to the book of John, Pastor Dan. Assignment for my baby girl. Now, what I'm telling you, that when, remember we talked about uh, Israel went astray? Remember how we talked about the main meaning of that means seduced? And the main meaning is not sexual, it means seduced from truth to to error, or from truth to a lie? See, when we the church, let's look at us preachers, let's just start right here. When we preachers want to say things that will tickle people's ears, when our goal is to get them back, in the church, not get them to hell, not to, I'm sorry, the, uh, not get them to heaven, letting them come and be on their way to hell. When we care more about church attendance than people's relationship with God, when we love people tithe more than their soul, we are in trouble. Amen. Come on, say them, God. So what I'm telling you, God raising up shepherds. I'm talking about a Zadok priesthood as remnant that you see Zadok here as a remnant people that will be faithful. They will not bother need to bail. Or Astaroth, which basically means just put in these two categories when you when you hear those two things, money and sex. Yeah. Two ruling spirits over this nation, money and sex. Yeah. It's either money or sex. You just that's gonna get it. That's gonna cover a whole lot of ground. Okay, so here's what's happening. So because because with everything that was going on in that nation, everything false going on in with the so called house of God, everything false in church, everything yeah. The world had gone away, and they'd gone astray. They had been seduced from truth to a lie, from the, from the truth of Jesus Christ to doctrines of demons. Do you know that there are churches in this nation that from their pulpit, they're preaching doctrines of demons? Okay? And so they go there, and they get indoctrinated by doctrines of demons, and doctrines of men, and traditions of men that make null and void the Word of God. That's why some people will walk in the door, and the truth preaching here will make them mad. But there's other people walking here, and the truth makes them glad. And you will know the difference by their response. Okay? And what I'm telling you, God's raising up, God's raising up a priesthood, a Zadok priesthood, that go preach the truth. That wants God's favor rather than the multitude's favor. That wants God's favor rather than the nation's favor. That wants God's favor rather than the city's nation favor. Come on, say to God. Come on, come on say to God, give God. Come on, give God some praise. Give God some praise. When you see yourself as remnant, when you see yourself as faithful, see, we can look at the people that fall away. We can look at the people that are not serving God, the people that have walked away from God. Don't ever get your eyes off of God and your own relationship with God. You're going to be found faithful. See, I keep going back to whenever I was a, when I was a he, when I was a full-fledged hippie in a band, all the stuff that I was into back there. God had an answer, and his answer was the Jesus movement. There was no one on earth lower than a hippie in America. Come on, say I'm telling you. They would mock you, they'd spit at you, curse you out, they'd tell you all kinds of things. They'd get a job. You know, all the... <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just inject this. I haven't said this for a long time. You know, because, because my, my hair was as long as Carla's there and, uh, and as a hippie. When, when I was around, and those of you that listen by CD, uh, I'm white as a sheet. White folk didn't treat me very well. And people of color treated me real well. So I went and lived in the middle of the ghetto as a hippie. Come on. Because they accepted me. And I went and lived right, right in the middle. See, uh, people that you might say a different race, but same spirit. See, they treated me better. Come on, there's a message there. There's a message there. But let's get back into the See, there's, a, there's a many prophetic pictures in here. You cannot... Um, see, here's a, a lot of trouble. People are trying to preach their concept of God. Well, God would never do that. Yes, He would. People are trying to preach a God that's different than what God said about Himself. Because they're trying, they're trying to baby people... 
treat people like little bitty uh, intelligent people, try to baby beg people to come to the house of God. Oh, now, now I'm going to hell now. Come on now, let me tell you how good heaven is. Now, come on, Saints of God, I'm telling you. I'm telling you that we can't be, a, I'm not ashamed of who God is. And God is not ashamed of who God just says, write in His Word who He is and what He'll do. If It says this in His Word. He'll cause it to rain in one place and not in another. He said, I'll, I'll change the, the desert to a water garden, and the water garden, I'll, I'll change it to a desert. That's how powerful God. He will do what He needs to do to get you saved. Yes. Yes. Or to get our attention. Or they, like, like, he, like He did David to get ba- David back in the track. So in verse 23, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. Now, God is raising up shepherds that's going to love God and love people more than they love their title and position being up in front of people. They will love people's souls more than their tithe. I'm really preaching now. Come on, Saint of God. I'm really preaching now. They will teach the people the difference between the holy and the profane. Now, the holy means this, something pronounced or observed and clean, it means something that has been dedicated to God, it means something that has been sanctified, something that has been consecrated, something that has been consecrated to purification. Now, Jesus said in John 17, 19, he said, For their sakes, for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they might be sanctified by the truth. For their sake, for other people's sake, I, Jesus, will sanctify myself that they may be sanctified. See, there's something so far beyond tolerating a church service for an hour and a half and not waiting, can't wait to get out. There's something about the experience of God living in you. You become the temple of God, and God, you feel, you begin to think like God, you see like God, you hear like God, you begin to feel like God, and the things that move God begin to move you. And so what happens is, you'll say, Man, it, with, with all the distractions out there in the world, everything that the world has to offer, to be able to walk away, see, if, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Deny self. That's all I live for was myself, my fleshly appetites. See, remember, let's back up. Remember the person that came in? There had been no change in life. There had been no change inwardly in their heart. There was no change outwardly in their flesh. And there's false leadership that will not confront them, that doesn't love them. And all it is, it ends up being a church game. And there are people that love to have it that way. They love to have their ears tickled because they have no intention. Now, um, I lost my train of thought there. Let me go back to this, okay? Okay, I, I, need, I want to just develop this one, one little thing right here just a little bit. Um, Okay, let's go. Let's go to John. I got. I got other thing. Now, well, before we go to John, let's go to Joshua three. Let me pick that up. Because that word, uh, holy and the profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. That's very important that we can discern the difference between the clean and the unclean. Yes. Okay, to discern means to know, to to perceive, to understand, to recognize. The difference between the unclean, which the file the contaminated, and the polluted. Now, Joshua chapter 3. Now, this is going to begin to punctuate everything. Joshua chapter 3, and uh, verse 5. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourself, for tomorrow God would do great wonders among you. Now, why did God say that? What God gave, put this in Joshua... Now, the, here's the revelation. That after 40 years, well, let's back up, 400 years in Egypt, and then 40 years of wandering, Moses, God uses Moses to bring them out, and they wandered for 40 years. Now Moses had passed on, went home with the people of the Lord, and Joshua's the new leader. And, he, and so they come into the land, so Joshua says, so they come right now to the River Jordan. And the River Jordan always represents death to self. Okay, so what God wants us to do, there's no resurrection without dying to dying to the flesh, dying to the natural man, so that we become the spiritual man. So when there's a burial, when there's a water baptism, you're burying the old man and you raise the new life of Christ. So we die to who we were, we become a new person in Jesus Christ. Okay, so in, in Joshua here saying, God, Joshua said to the, to the people, sanctify yourself. The word sanctify, make, your, make it holy. 
to consecrate, to purify, dedicate, and cleanse yourself. What if we consecrated our life to win the world for Jesus? Now, let me back up. I want you, because I'm not going to let this go. Because I, I got a hold of this. This motivated me. Negative things can motivate me. An enemy, many times, can move me more than a friend. Let an enemy, let someone threaten to kill me, and I'm motivated. I'm focused now. Now, friend, I, I love you, Pastor Bill. That's good. But with someone trying to kill me, I'm concentrating now. Okay, come on, this is, this is very important. So when Bruce Jenner in the interview said, I'm going to change the world. He's willing to be mocked and ridiculed. He knows there's going to be a whole lot of opposition. But he believes in his cause, as wrong as it is. He believes in his cause. How much do we believe in? I'm motivated now. God is using this guy to motivate me. So I come into the I come into the sanctuary and I'm walking the floor and I'm telling God, I'm gonna get right. I'm, I'm gonna give you every day for the rest of my life. If he has dedicated himself to change the world, come on. Don't expect to come in here and get some little warm whip, sissy pansy little dunk tiptoe through the tulips message. God loves you, and then we take up three offerings and send you home. No, we need truth that will set us free. I need some kind of commitment. I want an anointing. Come on. I want an anointing that would destroy Dr. Bundy. And if, if Bruce Jenner is committed to changing the world, come on, I'm going to commit. Come on. I'm going to believe at least for the church in this city. Come on. You see what I'm saying? I need that time, that kind of determination. Now, this... Bruce Jenner's not a fool in the, in the sense that he knows that not everybody's going to be with him. He knows there's going to be some talking about him. Sound doctrine? Am I telling the dream? He, but he's willing. He's willing to pay the price for what he believes in. Are you and I? See, when, when we get, when we start saying with our life that we say with our mouth we believe in, I God, my God, help me, God. Help me to get committed. So when, when Joshua said this, see, I'm going to say this over and over. There's the world and then there's church plan. But there's real Christianity, which is the remnant. And the remnant will not compromise. The remnant will not play church. Come on, say, if we're going to, don't tell me. Don't tell me I can't have that out there and can't have this in here. If I can't have that, I want this. If I can't have this, I want that. Don't tell me I can't have either one of them. Come on, you see what I'm saying? If I can't. Don't tell me I come in here and I can't have this. Don't tell me I can't prophesy. Don't tell me I can't shout. Don't tell me I can't dance before God. Don't tell me I can't cast out devil. Don't tell me I can't heal the sick. If it's in the Word, we're going to do it. Because I'm, we're not trying to uh, please people who have no intention upon going up with God. If we're going to do this, let's go all the way with God. You see what I'm saying? Let's go all the way with God. If Bruce Jenner is that committed to what he believes in, let's get committed. See, that's why we're, that's why you're here on a Wednesday night. See, that's the remnant. Zadok remnant. So you got to see, Zadok is remnant. So we're going, we're not coming here. This said some kind of Christian social club, Lonely Hearts Club. We don't have anything else to do on a Wednesday night. Come on, we we'll come here. Tell me with God. You come to the burning bush, you're going to get something from God. Your life is going to be changed. You're not leaving here like you came in here. We come to, Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come into me and drink. As the scripture has said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Don't tell me a river can't flow out of me. If God said again, the river is flowing right now. Freedom, freedom, saints of God. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Go and tell God, you want everything that he has. Don't let me play church, God. Wake me up, God. Use me to wake in the, wake me up. Wake our, wake this church up, God. Wake up this city, God. Give us soul, God. Give us a breakthrough. I mean, we'll believe with me. Yes. We're going to believe a breakthrough, yes. awakening in the church. Amen. If Bruce Jenner can believe he's going to change the world, we're going to believe we're going to change the church and change the city. Yes. We'll be concerned about the nation further on down the trail. Amen. So when Joshua said unto the people, sanctify yourself. In other words, see, we got the, you, you can't come into a holy God living dirty. Yes. When you know something sin, confess it, repent, get rid of it. You can't take this on the journey. So he said, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. For tomorrow, God will do wonders. 
That's what you, that's vision. Without a vision, the people perish. If you don't know where you're at, if you don't know where you're going, you wander in the wilderness. But see, God, what is God doing through Joshua? He's giving them vision. So they know where they're at. They know they're going somewhere. So the very fact that they know they're going somewhere, they're motivated to change, to sanctify themselves. They're going to get right. They're going to stay right. Because tomorrow, God is going to do great wonder. The devil's at to your hope. He's at to your spirit of expectation. So that we just wonder uh, listfully. We just, you know, uh, the wind blows it to and fro. Sanctify yourself. Tomorrow, God will do wonders among you. And uh, don't turn to these. I'm going to just quote this real quick. In uh, Hosea 10, 12, sow to yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. For it's time to seek God until he come and rain righteousness upon you. Break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground is, is ground, by my definition, I know different people define it differently. But I was raised down in the country and, and around a lot of farms and they'd, they'd plant a crop in, the, in this field and then they would harvest, let's just say they planted corn and they, and they harvested the corn and they leave the corn stalks behind. But the next year they don't plant it. They don't plow and they don't plant. And the field just laid there to be called fallow ground. Unused, ground that once was used. Come on, were you? did you once have a prayer life and now you lost your prayer life? Did you once have an anointing and now no anointing? Did God once have a hold of your heart and now doesn't have a hold of your heart? And once you, were you once alive in God? Were you once experiencing resurrection, life, the same spirit that raised Christ in the dead, was thoroughly and quickened and make a life your mortal body? You had vision. You couldn't wait to get there just now. See, fallow ground, see, I knew. So he said, break up your fallow ground. The time that we're wasting, stop wasting time and use it to seek God and you'll come alive again. You can get if David, if David can lose ground and get it back again, if David was not lied about, he wasn't falsely accused, he was guilty. Yes. Yes. Oh, Lord. You may come to church with coconut with parakeet crumbs right on your hand. You may have took the parakeet today. But you can confess and repent and get back right. You weren't lying about it. You weren't false with you. You choked that little bird. And you hope he didn't fly in the door and tell on you. <laughs> now, because this is a serious hour. Um, before, before I begin the message, I told you that I had to pray. There's a different vision from Wednesday night, Friday night, Saturday prayer, and Sunday morning service. And different people here at different times because of their work schedules. I had about 15, 15 messages because the word is so alive to me right now. I got about 15 messages, maybe 15 to 20 to preach, depending which, which ways this go. And God gave me this message for tonight. So what I want you to understand, there are people here that, there are people here that work very, very, very hard for God. And they work in this ministry. And I want you to know, and, and Pastor Jen and I work very hard. And we're working for God. I said that to say this. We don't want to waste a single church service. So every time we come together, we're not going to dunk a few donuts and tiptoe through tulips and take up three offerings and then go home. If we're going to come here, Come on, saints of God. If we're going to come here, I want to meet with God. I'm going to get something from God. If any man thirsts, let him come into me and drink. we got to learn how to drink spiritually and absorb and choke up and receive the very life of God, the Spirit of God, the anointing of God. I'm not living the rest of my life in church without the power of God, the fullness of the things of God. I want my inheritance. Okay, now before I go on, I got to go back. I got to pick up something back in Ezekiel 44, so I can go on. And then time getting away from me. But I promise to get you out by 4 a.m. so you have time to take a shower before you go to work. Let me just say, uh, you know, and I, you may have to get up very early in the morning if you. You may not be able to stay till the end. We won't get offended if you leave, and you don't get offended us if we stay. When God's finished, <laughs> well, and I'll say it. I'll say it. We don't, the clock, the clock. Okay, verse twenty-eight. I want. Let me get this in here. Then, uh, 
pick up a couple more scriptures. In verse 28, back in Ezekiel 44. Uh, yeah, Ezekiel 44. And they shall come to them, remember, teach the difference between the holy and the profane. And they shall come to them, who? The, the, the teaching, the remnant that's been faithful. They were found faithful when the nation fell away, when the city fell away, when the multitude fell away, when a lot of the Levites fell away. There were sons of the Levites. So the, there was a Zedah preacher. They did not fall away. You have not fallen away. No way. It says down here, verse 20, and it shall be to them, for them that did not fall away, for an inheritance. And it says right here, and, and I think Pastor Jan interpreted the tongues, that God said, God said to us tonight, and with a prophetic word, I, God, am your inheritance. See, you and I, we are his inheritance. So it's, that's, okay, when you understand that, and the fullness, then that everything that belongs to Jesus, then belongs to the believer. Are you a believer? Okay, if you're born again, then everything that belongs to Jesus, so then we've been grafted in, and we get the same reward as Jesus. Okay, we get the same inheritance. Okay, so it says, verse 20, It shall be unto them for an inheritance. I am their inheritance. And you shall give them no possession in, in, their, in Israel, for I am their possession. In other words, it, I'm not going to give them land or gold or silver. I'm going to give them myself. When you have God, you find money is easy to come by. Jobs are easy to come by. That everything, when you get right with God, and God is your inheritance, you get right with God, you watch everything fall in the line. Yeah. And that, with that green fly right there. Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Let me get a cough drop here. All right. <laughs> now let me go to, <coughs> let me go to uh, Corinthians. Okay, 2 Corinthians 6. And I'll read this fast and then go to the next one that is very good. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. <laughs> Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship does righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion does light have with darkness? The answer is none. I could develop a lot here, but I... I See, that's why you don't want to fellowship with darkness, okay? And what what agreement does Christ have with Belial, which means worthlessness, or what part does he, uh, does the believer have with an unbeliever? The answer is none. And what agreement what agreement has the temple of God with idols? The answer is none. For you are the temple of the living God, as God had said, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them, I will be their God, they shall be my people. Now here's what I want to get across, okay? Wherefore, then come out from among them, be a separate people, saith the Lord. Okay, so then what happens then, if you're going to go on this journey with God, he said, sanctify yourself, tomorrow God will do great wonders. There's going to be a crossing over that Jordan, they're going to go into the promised land, that all these years, you've been wandering in this wilderness, and the crossing of the Jordan represents death to self, and God has this inheritance, no longer will the things of God be futuristic, you're going to begin to enter in. There will be manifestation of the promises of God. That's basically an aspect of the promised land. So he says, come out from among them, said the Lord. Do not touch the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord God Almighty. You've got to come to that place. Your identity is a child of God. God is your father. You've got to see no matter how old you could be, someone on earth, 95 years old, and still see God as your father, because God's a whole lot older than 95. Because when you enter in to the father-child relationship, there's a fullness. Now, here's what I want to say with here. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, now, what I'm telling you, see, when you can see the things of God being better than anything that the world had, remember, all that's in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, all that is is built upon sinking sand. So here's what he said. Having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, let's cleanse ourselves, the word cleanse, let's make ourselves clean, let's purge ourselves, let's purify ourselves. It means to remove stains, dirt, disease, and the defilement of sin. 
Okay, so uh, that's what this refers to. Remember earlier we were talking about people came to church, but they didn't allow God to change their life. They didn't, God, they didn't allow God to change the inward man. They did not allow God to change the outward man. So God has a faithful priesthood that will preach truth, that will teach the people the difference between the holy and the profane. Okay, so then that will preach, let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh. What I'm telling you, in doctrines of demons, doctrines of men, and traditions of men, there will be people that will be teaching or what, what uh, the book of Revelation said, the doctrine of Nicolaitans, and the Nicolaitans is the one saved, always saved, unconditionally doctrine that, and what, the, what Nicholas, who was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans taught, was that man, man is basically good. Uh, he's not responsible for the deeds of his flesh. And so that he can do anything he wants to do with the flesh and still go to heaven. That's basically what the doctrine of the Nicholas, the Nicolaitans, and God said, I hate that doctrine. So they said that uh, you could do anything in your flesh, and God is saying, cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh. Now let's go to John. This is what I wanted to get in there. Now some of this is really, this right here, really is going to punctuate a whole lot of everything that's been said tonight. Okay, in John chapter 15, and uh, go to verse 7, I, I won't elaborate fully on this, I'll just comment some. Verse 7, if you abide in me, the word abide means dwell, remain, continue, endure. There's something very different to come to the church for an hour and a half on Sunday morning and then giving the devil the other 166 hours out of the week. Okay, so there's an abiding. In other words, you read your word, you're praying, you're driving down the road, you think upon the things of God, you've got Christian music on, you got preaching on, you're abiding, you're abiding in Him. In other words, you don't just come and put your body in a church building for an hour and a half on Sunday morning and think that's what a Christian is. No, it's abiding. Jesus said, if you're abiding me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. But that's a conditional promise. You get to abide in Him. Herein, now here's, what, here's God's will for your life right here. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So does God want you fruitful? Yes. He sure does. Yes. So herein, here's how God gets glory by making you fruitful. He'll come. Our life could be like a desert. God come to that desert, make it like a water garden, and that's how God received glory. By you and I changing from a desert to a water garden. From a cucklebird to a beautiful flower. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You can ask what you want, it shall be done. Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. All right, uh, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, that your joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Does God want you joyful? Yes, okay, here's the key. When, and when I was a young, real young man, I believed, I believed playing ball, that was my joy. When I got a little older, then partying, drinking, drugging, fornicating, partying, then I thought that's what, I thought that brought me joy. But I never really knew joy. I had some fun, but I never really knew joy until I got saved. Because in His presence, in His presence, see, we can be in church and not be in His presence. So we learn how to live so that we have the favor of God. We have the, what we call the manifest, manifested presence of God within our life. Okay, so He said, these things I've spoken to you, why would He give you His Word? Why does He want people to preach? That your joy may be full, that you may be, that your His words would abide in you, and that you would be fruitful. Here's how Father God is glorified, that you would be fruitful. That your joy may uh, may be full. Um, let's go down to verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I, God, I have chosen you. And I have ordained you that you should go forth, that you should bring forth fruit, and that your fruit would remain. And that whatever you ask of Father... See, I had a healthy relationship with my daddy. If I needed something, I could go to my daddy and tell my daddy I needed... So it's easy for me to believe in the Father God. And now some people that they've not had a healthy picture of, of a natural daddy, uh, but uh, I had. So it said, whatever you ask Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now verse 18, see if, see if you've experienced any of this. If the world hate you, you ever felt any hatred? 
Do you ever get saved and you thought, oh, everybody's going to like me now? Yeah, they're down. <laughs> if the world hate you, you'd know that they hated me before they hated you. Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not you are not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So where will hatred come at you through? Worldly people? Now what I'm telling you, when we go all the way back to Ezekiel back there, we go through that whole mess, there were people, there was the world, and then there's people who came to the church, they'd not been changed. And they could be in church or out of church and still hate you. Oh, yes. Because they're not saved. Yep. See? Now, he said right there. Verse 19, if you, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because, because you are not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world... You have to understand because you are right with God. Now, another aspect when you go back there in Ezekiel, see, because Satan is trying to get the pulpit to compromise. So there's doctrines of demons, doctrines of men, and traditions of men, because if we preachers, if we preachers would rather have acceptance from people than acceptance from God, then we become idolatrous, and then we are bringing death upon people coming to the house of God and that's the whole thing that God was trying to explain back there well he wasn't he was he explained it real, real well I was trying to explain it <laughs> let's put, let's put it that way okay now so if if you were of the world the world would love it have you ever you ever been around some people you joke and jive with them they're fine with you but if you tell them the truth Now, you talk about stirring up some devils. Mm-hmm. See, the whole thing is, so, so then, they'll hate you, yeah. but they, they say that you're the hater. Yeah. That's what they say. That's what they say in the media. Yeah. That's what they say in the news. Oh, yes. the, the hate language, if, yeah. if you call sin, sin, they say, well, you're a hater. Yeah. And they're the ones spewing out the hate. That's right. the terrorists. If you were of the world, the world would love us own, but because you, you are not of the world, that's, that's the remnant. That is, that is the Zadok priesthood that remained faithful, though the nation fell away, though Jerusalem fell away, though the multitude fell away, though a lot of the Levites fell away. They were still in the sanctuary, and they remained faithful. What they did, they got in position, and they stayed in position. Here's the question. Who or what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall famine, shall sword? Hasn't Satan tried to separate you from the love? Okay. I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world will hate you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his Lord. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, Jesus, they will persecute you. The word persecute means this, to pursue with hostile intent. They will pursue you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Now, I'm going to share the scripture. I'm going to try to close. I said before I'd close, and I found out I fibbed a couple of times. So I learned to say, I'll try to close. Some of you know me well. Verse 21. But all these things they will do unto you for my name's sake, because they do not know God, the Father. Who has sent me? What did God just say? What did Jesus say about them? They do not know. They do not know. So there's the hatred. Okay, there's the whole thing that we're trying to discuss back there. That prophetic picture in Ezekiel. There's a picture of the world. There's a picture of false religion. People playing church games. And there's a picture of the remnant. And, And remnant people, you find people... In a lot of churches, a lot of denominations, a lot of organizations, they have remained faithful to God. Even though many, most of the people maybe in that church or that denomination have fallen away from God, they are right with God. They're, they're right relationship with God. They know God. And uh, I could go into a lot about knowing God, the, the importance in 
we had uh, Pastor Janice pass these out. This is your, a part of your inheritance, okay? God is your inheritance. This is what God has for you. And the important thing about this is, if you don't get this, then you may still secretly desire that. But when you get God, and you begin to get what God has for you, it will set you free. You will no longer be looking back. You'll be, be looking forward. Because God, God will invade your present to give you a future. Let's wait just briefly upon the Lord. Let's sit in.